Do not tell this vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. As in all passages from Scripture, we are to learn the lessons of the Lord. And indeed, the introduction prayer to the Mass, at least in its old translation, sets the theme for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And the first word of the old translation is remember. And it is particularly the mystery revealed to the three apostles that we are to remember from today's gospel. For it is to be our strength through this veil of tears. And so the Lord in manifesting his transfigured body chooses three apostles, not arbitrarily, but according to the role that they would have in the mystical body of Christ. And as is always the case when Peter is present in a listing of the apostles, his name comes first because as Peter, he was chosen to become the rock, the foundation on which Christ would build his church, the leader and head of the apostolic college. Next, we hear of St. James, the brother of St. John, because he was to be the proto martyr of the apostolic college and the, and the patriarch of Jerusalem in which his see would be established, in which he would ultimately suffer that death from the parapet and would show very clearly why the Lord named him a son of thunder. For he was thrown from the parapet and his legs would be crushed but there, not quite dead, he would continue to preach and admonish the chosen people to repent of their sins and turn to the Messiah. Next is Saint John, because he is the disciple whom Jesus loved and whose care he bequeathed to his mother. And so, ultimately, in choosing these three, the Lord wishes that every member of the mystical body learn a lesson for these three in their prominence signify the whole of the mystical body and all of us are included in that bequeathal at the cross in which the Lord tells St. John, son, behold your mother and hence every member of the mystical body to behold their mother. And let us, <clears throat> as we reflect upon this mystery, always call to mind the humility exhibited by the apostles. <clears throat> For often we do not consider that when we read the scripture, St. Peter had the authority not to allow these manifestations of his weakness to be published. He had the authority to tell St. Matthew not to publish his gospel. He had the authority to tell St. Mark, who was his anoesis, that is, his secretary, not to publish his gospel. He had the authority to tell St. John and all, and all the evangelists not to publish the gospels, and yet, he would allow them to be published and he would not have his faults and failings glossed over in the least so that we would all learn that it is not by our human talents that we are to remain faithful to God, but it is through our humble submission to God and the reception of his grace. And so St. Peter allows this to be published and again, it manifests his weakness, it manifests his lack of dependence. And what was the root of his lack of dependence? For three years, St. Peter, the apostles and all the disciples were prepared for, by the Lord, prepared especially for this, his final journey from Galilee <coughs> or to Jerusalem, that is, that final journey in which the last Paschal meal of the old dispensation would be offered up and the figurative lamb would ultimately be replaced by the sacrifice of the Lamb of God and that Paschal meal will continue until the end of time because it is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so all that the Lord came into the world would be fulfilled on this final journey. And what was the apostles' response? For three years did not the Lord show his disciples that they had every reason to be faithful to him. His words, which had the power to convert hearts, the most hardened of sinners, they saw, and man, they saw before their very eyes convert the most hardened of sinners. They were the recipients of his most tender love, the feeding of the multitude, 
uh, the, 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 the raising from the dead, the tears that he would shed over Jerusalem and over Lazarus and over others, the most tender love of the Lord, and in the feeding of the multitude, it would point to a higher and more glorious spiritual reality, that is, the feeding of the soul through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. They were witnesses to it all. They witnessed and received his patient endurance of their most untoward behavior. And indeed, St. Peter often would be the one who would remonstrate with the Lord most clearly, indeed. He showed very clearly in one occasion that while he recognized this power and this authority that God manifested that would convert the sinners, that same power and authority that even his enemies would recognize, as St. John tells us, in putting these words in our Lord, relating these words of our Lord, many good works I have done and showed you from my Father, for which of these do you seek to stone me? And what would be the response of the Pharisees and scribes? It is not for your good works that we stone you, but you make yourself equal to God. That is, they declared, we find nothing wrong in you, except you make yourself equal to God. Why did they object to this? Not because they didn't recognize his divinity, or at least they had good reason to suspect that he was truly God because they had no reason to doubt he was the Messiah. For everything that was to be fulfilled, they saw very clearly in the Lord to be fulfilled, and they saw they had reason to simply remain silent and let the mystery of the incarnation unveil. But it was because he came to change their operation, that is, to put them out of business no longer were they to use their authority to ultimately gain the rewards of this world over the chosen people. And so, while they had every reason to believe he was the Messiah, they also had reason to believe he was the Son of God. And so, even the enemies would recognize in all these works of the Lord something unique, something divine, and it was that divinity that the Lord wished to instill in the hearts and minds of the disciples as he would ultimately travel to, to, to Jerusalem in order to suffer and die for us. But the Lord knew the weakness of his disciples, and so today he would go an extra step and he would arm those three prominent leaders of the apostolic college so that when the terrible trial to their faith would unfold, they would have the means to overcome it. In the transfiguration, the Lord in his mercy provides an extraordinary grace that is the vision of the glory to come to arm us against the terrible temptation to the ordinary lot of Christians to abandon Christ when faced with the cross. That is the trial and the tribulation that every member of the mystical body and every member of the human family must ultimately come to grips with. For each and every one of us will have manifested to us not our own crucifixion, for there is only one who is truly crucified, and that is the Lord. But in every attempt to destroy human dignity and human honor, we must see an attempt to crucify the Lord of all goodness again. And so we must ask the question, what do we do when Christ is seized, handcuffed, and sent from one court to another and does nothing to defend himself? His divine power seems to be dormant when, the, when by worldly standards he should most readily use it. And indeed, St. Peter would tell the Lord the very same thing when he took him aside in order not to embarrass him in front of the other apostles and basically said, Lord, I have seen your power. The only problem is you don't seem to know how to use it. To which the Lord would simply say, Peter, get behind me, Satan. And we are not to understand that in the common way it is understood as if our Lord was relating St. Peter to be equal with Satan at that moment. He uses the word Satan here in its literal meaning. Right now, Peter, you're acting more like an adversary to me. Remain silent, get behind me, follow my lead. That is what he is telling him. He is not saying, Peter, thou art Satan incarnate. 
and that is often misunderstood. Peter was a weak man, but of the apostles, he was the one who loved the Lord most dearly. Remember, it says of St. John, he was the beloved disciple of the Lord. It doesn't say that St. John had the greater love for the Lord. That is clear from Scripture that it was always and everywhere St. Peter who would come out at the bequest of the Lord and then begin to think, I'm walking on water, and then fall into trouble. But he was, of the apostles, the one who loved the most. And it is precisely for that reason that he was entrusted with the keys. And perhaps it is true that of the apostles, he was the weakness, that is, in his struggle against fallen humanity. But it was that love that which he would be rewarded. And so we too must ask the question, because we know the result of the first Calvary, that not even the beloved disciple of the Lord in the end, who was at the foot of the cross, would be there through that great trial and tribulation when the power of God seemed to take a hiatus from his very creation as the sacred humanity of Christ lies dead in the tomb outside of the chosen city. It was only at that point the faith of the Virgin Mary that sustained the world. Her faith in the apostles whom she asked her son to call because all graces come to us through the Immaculate Virgin Mary. She, at that moment, was sustaining them all so that we would all come to know this witness of the transfiguration and why the Lord manifested it to these three so that they would hand it on to his mystical body until the end of time. But of all these things, there is something even more disturbing that the Lord is trying to point out and arm the apostles against. And that th this thing is, what will we do when the crowds who just a few days before the crucifixion and death greeted him with the most enthusiastic of hosannas, hosanna to the son of David, hosanna on high. What do we do when those crowds who knew him and loved him turn and demand his torture and his death? What do we do when he is crucified amidst the insults of his triumphant enemies? For the majority of the mystical body in our day and age, it is to compromise. To compromise in language, to compromise in all things. Classic example. Because we refuse to offend someone, we will try to use the language and we will not call things what they are. We will call the killing of a child in the mother's womb rather than the murder of a child in his mother's womb. That is a compromise. And it is precisely this that the Lord is warning us against. For the most part, men can deal with tyrants when the crowds are opposed to them. But when the crowds go along, most of us fail and join in and hunker down and run away as the apostles did on the first crucifixion. And as Pope Leo XIII said, it is not the Christian mentality to become a pacifist. For he says, Christians were born for combat and it is the combat of Christ that they are born for. It is the conquering of the tyrant of this world. And so it is this that really undid the apostles. And we see that very clearly, for St. Peter would allow that report to be published that would manifest his true weakness. But before reflecting upon it, we must reflect upon the words of blessed Cardinal John Henry Newman, who has so well summed up the state of our fallen nature. He says, Satan is a tyrant over us, and it seems to us useless to rebel. If we attempt it, we are but overpowered by his huge, by his huge might and his oppressive rule, and are made twice the children of hell that we were before. We may groan, we may groan and look about, but we cannot fly from this country. Such is our state by nature. What is he referring to? That if we try to gain victory 
by the standards of this world. We will only be brought down by the leaders of this world. It is the same thing that the apostles did and that we often find ourselves doing. When our minds, our hearts, and everything about us should be on the vision of Tabor, we look at the might of the enemy and we cower and we fear and we crumble because we do not keep our eyes on the true meaning of being children of the resurrection, so often misunderstood and used as a justification to simply go about doing whatever we will in this life by way of the carnal pleasures it presents to us. We are children of the resurrection as if sin can't touch us, but we know full well that it is precisely when this attitude becomes institutionalized in society, then sins that are abhorrent to God, as the Catechism points out, sins that cry to God for vengeance, like the sin of Sodom, the sin of usury, that is, the unjust depriving of a man of his labor. We don't often reflect, even in our own society, that a man's wages was never considered taxable. It was considered private property. Usury is one of the common sins of our world that is accepted and justified by even members of the mystical body. And it is none other than to try to gain the wealth in this world because with it we can purchase the pleasures or the power of this world. It is not to look on the vision of Tabor, the Lord gives this to these three so that they would give it to the mystical body until the end of time so that during these most dark of times we may behold the brightness that is to come. That brightness manifested in the glorified body of our dear Lord and Savior. And so the apostles themselves would not look upon Tabor and and the most courageous of them, St. Peter, would succumb to the trial brought by a servant girl and deny the Lord because he looked to the warmth of the fire and not the warmth of the vision that just a few days prior he was privileged to behold. And St. Peter has allowed this truth to be promulgated through the Gospels until the end of time so that all of us may take that warning that he himself gives us in the scripture. Be aware of your opponent, the devil, for he roams about the world like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. As Cardinal Newman has eloquently put out, to try to struggle on the terms of Satan is to gain twice the hell that we deserve in, 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 in our fallen nature. And so it is to Tabor that we must turn. And then we learn the mystery of why the two who were there with the Lord were chosen. Moses summarizing the law and Elias the prophet. And the Lord, according to every doctor and father of the church, contrary to the modest interpretation, took the middle spot. And Moses and Elijah were below him, worshiping him, adoring him, glorifying him, so that he was clearly pointed to the apostles as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And then the father himself would put the punctuation point on the mystery and point out beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is true God and true man. For it is the Father who witnesses to the divinity. And so Christ becomes the second Moses, but much more important than the first because he is the fulfillment of the first Moses who did what? Delivered the chosen people from the tyranny of Pharaoh. Moses, figurative of Christ, Pharaoh, figurative of Satan. And in that we learn everything that Satan tries to do to lead us astray. What was the characteristic note of Egypt? It is the same characteristic note of pagan Rome and pagan Greece and pagan Babylon and every pagan culture. Affluence. Affluence. The worst chastisement that God can send upon any society because affluence keeps our minds and our hearts on this earth 
and we refuse to raise them to Tabor because we do not want to let go of what we see possible in this world by way of the carnal pleasures. And so, during this Lent, we must particularly reflect that the Lord permits the vision on Tabor not to joyfully and mindlessly go about declaring we are children of the resurrection, which is true, but it has to be understood in light of the cross. There is nowhere for the true Christian to escape persecution in this life. Nowhere. Because the Lord said himself, what they have done to me, they will, they will do to you. When is opposition to the Lord first manifested in his incarnation? From the very beginning. As soon as the leaders of this world discern that there might be a rival about, they seek to go out and annihilate him. And that is what our modern world is doing. They do it to all means. The only thing we have to look forward to in Lent during this season is the blasphemous presentations of whether the Lord knew who he was, put forward by all the so-called scientific stations, and all the other blasphemies that are reiterated over and over and over and over again to rip the love of Christ out of the heart of man and to banish him in accord with what St. Saint, Saint John Chrysostom would say were the most frightful words in Scripture for him. When the chosen people rose up under the instigation of the Pharisees and the scribes and in unison declared, we have no king but Caesar. We will not let that man lord it over us. And there is no example. Even his enemies admitted it. It is not for your good works that we condemn you. They admitted that the Lord never lorded anything over anybody. They admitted it. They simply refused the offering of his gift, their eternal salvation, the very reason he brought everyone into existence. And so, let us always remember that it is easy to be a saint when we live in our ivory castles, but the minute the walls come crumbling down and the world really shows itself, in its opposition to Christ, most of the disciples left, indeed, all save one. And that is precisely why she is our life, life our sweetness, and our hope. For St. Ber Bernadette of Siena and others don't hesitate to declare, during those three days in the tomb, the Blessed Virgin Mary preserves the very creation of God because he, de he says emphatically, if he had not foresawn the faithfulness of the Virgin Mary, he would have foregone the act of creation. And so literally, for that brief period of time, she is sustaining the faith of the apostles, the faith of the mystical body, the faith of the world, because she is the only one who has the love of Christ in her heart at that moment with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so, in these darkest of times, let us always turn to her, who, as the old Christians didn't hesitate to say, was terrible to demons and the hammer of heretics. That is in one of the ancient liturgies, because back then, men were men and women were women, and the Christians knew what they were about and they were about gaining victory for Christ. And scripture itself, for all those who would paint Our Lady in a way that is disrespectful, describes her very clearly as terrible in battle array. Terrible to who? Demons and the leader, the tyrannical reign of Satan. And yes, if we do not repent and continue to cooperate with him, then also ultimately terrible to his enemies. For God cannot permit a society continue into, into depravity, especially when the primary focus of that depravity is the perversion of children. The doctors and fathers and every saint who spoke on the matter were very clear that when society is noted 
by its perversion of children. And that perversion can take on many forms. We often think it just is a matter of the sixth and ninth commandment. It is not. The reason the devil works so hard at that is because if he can instill that into a young child, then he can lead them as scripture describes, describes like a pig with a nose snout, wherever he wants to lead them. But that perversion is also very subtle. How much history is a justification of the Industrial Revolution, which is a justification of greed? How much math no longer tells us two plus two is four, but Johnny has two mothers and Sally has two fathers. How many parents does the ch do the children have? That perversion is universal. How much geography destroys the Christian virtue of patriotism. And we blithely go along, don't even ask the question, despite the fact that there isn't an approved catechism in the church that doesn't state the primary obligation of, of, of parents is the, is the education in the Christian life of their children. That means they are to safeguard every aspect of their child's life. How often do we hear as a just, well, they're, all, they, you know, they're not going to learn how to deal with sin unless we put them in a sinful environment. What nonsense. Did the Lord ever allow that to happen? And when the children were in a sinful environment, it is then that the Lord was most angry to the point where he would tell the Pharisees and scribes because of their insistence on the perversion of children. Without hesitation, he turned and said, that's why you'll die in your sins. Because you won't listen to me. You won't stop. And all the doctors and fathers say, for those Pharisees and scribes present at that moment, and it began in his passion, because it was the children who first threw down the palms and declared Hosanna to the son of David. And then the leaders, do you hear them? Notice, when the Lord is present, they don't go to the children. Prior to that, they would shuttle them out of the way, get out, brat, leave, leave, leave. But they knew one thing about the Lord. When he was present, they better not challenge children directly. So they tried to turn to him. Do you hear what they're saying? And the Lord simply says, yes. Out of the mouth of babe, I have perfected praise. And then they told the Lord, shut him up. And that's when he responded, that's why you'll die in your sins. Because you don't even accept, the, I'll even forgive you for not accepting my own witness to myself. But to not accept the witness of those who you know can't deceive you, the little ones, that I can't overcome. I'll do everything, but I can't overcome that. And if that isn't an image of our modern society that never there was. And so it is Tabor that we must always keep our eyes on because in this life, the Christian will get dirty and bloodied because he has a mission to accomplish and that mission was accomplished by the blood, sweat, and tears of the Lord who literally had the soil encrusted into his precious blood as he fell on his way to Calvary. And he tells us all, if you do not have the blood, sweat, and tears, and the dirt that was on me, then I will have nothing to do with you. And that is our lot. Because we are to imitate the Lord, and that is to defend the human family from the tyranny of Satan, knowing full well that if the Lord and his mother want to use us for fodder in their cannons, what does it matter? For to perish in this life doing God's will is to gain, gain eternal life. It is to be freed from the tyranny of Satan and to be freed to join the mother of God and all the angels and saints who have already made it in their battle, as St. Maximilian pointed out, in this life, we are not really full members of, our, of God's army because with one hand, 
we must fight off the devil, and with the other we must hold on to the hand of the Immaculate. In heaven, both are free to do the work of the Immaculate. And so, let us particularly pray during this season of Lent that all members of the mystical body, and particularly a hierarchy, may keep their eyes on Tabor so that they may come to understand to defend the human family is to defend the Holy Family. And without the defense of the Holy Family, as Pope John Paul II would point out to the whole mystical body of Christ, whole Catholic dioceses would disappear. What does that mean from a vicar of Christ? The influence of Christ will even disappear in those places where it should never disappear, where the apostle's successes are willing to die, as St. Peter would, as St. James would, and as St. John would. That is why St. John can be celebrated both with white and red garments because it was only the miraculous intervention of the Lord that prevented him from actually undergoing a martyr's death, but he gained all the merit. For according to some doctors and fathers, there were several attempts to martyr him, and only miraculously did they never come to completion. And so, the Lord will defend us if we defend him. Let us resolve to always defend him in the manner the apostles did. It wasn't they who went looking for the mother of God. It was she who came looking for them. And so, let us have her find us. And then, with the apostles, we can sit with her, learn of these mysteries, and then go forth and do what the mother of God prepares every member of the mystical body of Christ to do. Be crucified in this life in order to participate in the glory of Christ in the life to come.